giving you a voice, and making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, FTC is produced in partnership with the Orange Alliance. Now FTC is a platform to keep up to date on live and archive first tech challenge events and team stats at theorangealliance.org. And by viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to FTC Live. Tonight, we will be having a roundtable discussion about a whole host of topics. We'll be, bringing, we'll be talking about the alliance selection process and approaching alliance selection in a professional manner. We will be talking about how, to, how two champs has impacted FTC and if we should be going back to one championship. We will then talk about uh, if there should be eight alliances per division at Worlds, should Worlds inspire winners get Hall of Fame status like FRC. And finally, we will be talking about mentor involvement and how involved mentors should really be in FTC. Uh, reporting for FTC Live, I'm Nathan. So tonight's all about the discussion, and we want you guys to weigh in too. If you have any questions or comments for our hosts, please tag at first updates now in the chat and we'll do our best to read them on air. I mean, so we have three amazing guests joining us tonight. Uh, we have Shishir, who's been on quite a lot from 12808 revamped robotics. We have uh, Josh from 8680 crack and pinion and Sean from 9794 wizards.exe who was on our show uh, just oh, two weeks ago. Uh, we have a few giveaways tonight, courtesy of GoBuilda. We'll be giving away two 24 to 1 ratio worm gear sets and one U channel bundle. Tyler, can you let our audience know how they can win these giveaways? Yep, if you're interested in uh, taking any of these cool giveaways from GoBuilda, all you have to do is later on during the show, we're going to have a keyword that you'll have to type in the chat. And if you'd like to win, please make sure you click that little follow button on top of the screen to be following the channel. And to get five times luck, uh, like some others have by subscribing already, for example, uh, by uh, Meiji uh, Whitaker, you'll get five times chance to win. So once again, subscribers get five times chance to win. You have to follow, and you can do so for free for subscribing through Twitch Prime if you like to, and we appreciate all your support. Good luck and enjoy the show. All right, so I think we're just going to jump right into our discussion. Uh, so our first kind of prompt is, our first topic is going to be alliance selection just in general. So uh, I guess I'll just throw out our questions. How should you approach alliance selection? Um, how should you interact? With, and then I guess uh, the more nitty gritty specifics is how do you interact with a team that you might not want to pick you? Um, and then we've got a few more things to talk about on that topic in a little bit. So whoever wants to take that off. so. How should you approach alliance selection in a professional manner? I think that gracious professionalism is the number one to think about uh, thing to think about when it comes to alliance selection. Um, a lot of teams are very gracious during alliance selection, and a lot of teams aren't necessarily gracious during alliance selection. And even though it's just one competition, I think it's important to think about how these relationships that you form during this alliance selection could affect you in the future. Because one time you may not want a team to necessarily pick you, but the next competition, you may want that team to really pick you. So it's important to maintain your relationships with all teams and be on equal footing with them. Um, and I think it's just important to be gracious and professional. Yeah, adding on to that, I think that like alliance selection, it should be like there are two things, right? It should really be about picking the teams that can really complement you and make your alliance the best that it can be. Um, I think that um, I think that especially for alliance selection, a lot of times um, people take it personally, and I think that it should be taken uh, like it should a step back should be taken from like what happens during alliance selection versus the relationship between the teams and how they interact with each other outside of that because it is a very tough time, right? If a team doesn't get picked, that would have done really well if they did get picked it's it is very unfortunate for that team and vice versa right if a team does get picked and they're like really happy about it it's it, it's it's hard it's hard because not every team can get picked it's hard that not every team you want to be picked can get picked or that those relationships can't be fostered but it's the unfortunate reality and i think that teams really should take that into consideration when going into this to really allow them to maintain those relationships much better mm -hmm. Something to build on that, I think a lot of alliance selection kind of comes down to the feel of the competition. 
I've been at a lot of events that feel really small. And when your top teams in an event all are really close and talk a lot, um, you can sometimes just talk with other alliance captains, make sure everybody's on the same page or try to get everyone on the same page. Um, and even if that means making finals as strong as they can be instead of necessarily making your alliance as strong as it can be, can be a benefit too. Absolutely. I know that that's something that I pride myself on is being extremely open to everyone on the field. It's like, mm-hmm. hey, we're going to pick this team, like as at least for our first pick because we know our first pick. It's like yeah. I like to let, let everyone know what we're doing so that there are no surprises going into it and everyone can really work around that and make the best alliances that they can make, um, just, not just the best alliance we can make. So actually the match that's playing right now, this is from the Orange Qualifier and um, – I was actually personally part of the line selection in this qualifier. And I think for the teams that were there, it was handled very, very well. There were some of, like, I think four of the five teams on this final fields are going, or four of the six teams on this final, five of the six teams on this final fields are actually going to Worlds. And wow. actually, no, all six of them are going to Worlds. Wow. <laughs> My bad. Yeah. Um, but wow. there was a lot of competition there. And the fact that everybody was gracious and everybody accepted what was going to happen and didn't try to do anything that was necessarily malicious to get picked or to not get picked, it really did make a difference. And I think there is a point of selling during alliance selection, like trying to convince captains that maybe you want to get picked or maybe you don't want to get picked. But I think there's a very fine line between selling and necessarily lying. And I think that teams should try to follow and make sure that they're as gracious as possible using that. So I actually have a question. That pretty well. I'll let you go. Uh, Do you think there's any way to, um, if say you don't want uh, a team to pick you, do you think there's any gracious or a graciously professional way to convince them not to do that? Or is it really not okay? Well, Well, I think there is. It's it's just, I say like, hey, I, we would, appreciate it if you don't pick us that's the i feel like that's the only gracious way to do that and i know that like at least in our state like that's something that happens and that's something that's acceptable um it's like hey we we really want to form our alliance because we think our robots can complement each other we would appreciate it if you don't pick us so that we will be able to do that um and i know that it seems odd and like and of course you're going to have those teams that won't listen to you right i know that that happened to us last year because like last year we were the second seed and we wanted to pick the third seed team but then the first seed team just like swept even though we specifically asked them just because they didn't want that alliance to form and of course that's going to happen but i think that that's the really way to like just be like hey this is what we want so please uh please respect our wishes if you so choose and of course you can't take it personally if the alliance captain doesn't choose to do that if they're like hey no we you, we think your alliance is going to be too strong we are still going to um break it up I was going to say, isn't that a valid, you know, in FRC, that's a very valid strategy, what we call scorched earth in many cases, right? So is, is that not as common in FTC? Not Scorch, really. Scorched earth isn't as common because we only have four alliances. Like, you can't mm-hmm. scorch a playing, well, I mean, you, I guess you can, it just means picking two teams. Yeah. Like, it's not as of a, as much of a um, big, big thing, because in, in FRC, like, you can go down your list, you can just, uh, just pick off seven, and then just ruin all of those alliances, but because of this, it's not as common here. It's yeah. also pretty rare that all four alliance captains are solidly supposed to be alliance captains. Mm. Um, like, a lot of times, three and four are kind of jokes, like, mm-hmm. really, and we'll just accept, even if you're not a very great team in first ranked. Yeah. And I mean, kind of as much as we hate it, I think what player five, five, six, seven, three said is kind of right. That strategic decisions are sometimes uh, different from gracious professional decisions. I don't personally don't think there's any way to be gracious about saying, hey, don't pick us. I mean, there is like the we don't think our robots are compatible. But that's that's essentially saying don't pick us because we're not going to win with you. Um, I know that like at Illinois this year, I got pretty mad at my team. Um, we were pretty much talking to we were talking to the first and second seeded teams uh, we were like 14th ranked and we knew that one would pick two because it was everyone knew that but then we wanted to be their second pick we ended up being their second pick and we essentially got the affirmative that we were their second pick and then our team members we got back in the pit i was like hey guys we're probably gonna be the second pick you don't necessarily need to talk to everyone um but they immediately were like all right guys a robot broke 
And I was like, yeah. what the fuck are you doing? Like, so excuse my <laughs> language. I don't, sorry, but like you can swear jar me if we have one. But um, I was like, what are you doing? Like, no, you can't do, I mean, you can't do that. If someone did that, I, I, I heard allegations that someone did that at NSR last year and I don't, I'm not going to get into that, but um, I, you just, there is no real gracious way to, uh, to say no. And yeah, I mean, I, if people are going to pick who they're going to pick, especially with four alliances. I know that at Midwest Regional two weeks ago, and this is different because there were eight, eight alliances, I was told by someone that the one wanted to pick like the third or fourth seed something, and that the seed that they were going to pick just told them, hey, just so you know, essentially save yourself the embarrassment. We're not going to pick you. We're not going to say yes in a much nicer way, of course. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think also um, one of the ways that you can – like, let's say you are going to be the second pick and you want to last until that second pick. You should necessarily scout yourself. I think a lot of teams don't scout themselves. And scouting yourselves is really, really good to show other teams what the strengths of your robot are. But it can also show some of the weaknesses. So, like, let's say there is another team that may be thinking about picking you. You may want to say, hey, our autonomous hasn't been as reliable Maybe we're going to be a better second pick for you, and that might help you get out of getting picked. But again, some people see that as a gracious professionalism problem. Yeah, I know I was pretty common to just say, "Hey, don't pick us, please." Um, and I don't think anyone's ever first picked a team who's asked to not. Just to yeah. my knowledge. Um, yeah, we'll grab some questions in the chat in from the chat in a minute. I think kind of going off this. I think I know what everyone's going to say, but what do you guys think of like throwing matches of or saying your robot's broken or t intentionally like taking apart a mechanism to make it actually look like your robot's broken? Like more bigger, mal I guess malicious is kind of a way to say that stuff like that. That of is course not graciously not. professional. No, that's not yeah. GP. <laughs> Absolutely so, not. Like that, I feel goes against like the values of what we're trying to do. Obviously, like I'm sure that everyone would agree with me on this, but it's just it's not something that needs to happen, and it's not something that like should happen. It absolutely should not be a thing that that's occurring. So, a side question that I have is: if you're pretty sure it's not going to affect the outcome of the match, what do you think about teams intentionally underperforming? So, like, I think if that your that's alliance would win either way. Uh, I, I, I feel like it's the same thing. I feel like if you're not playing um, to the fullest capacity of your robot, bar like robot issues, the bar like if we play too hard, maybe our robot's going to break, right? If you want to be conservative in that aspect, I think that's okay. But you should be playing every single match to the best of your ability. Um, I, I think that that's just that's just that that goes off of that gracious professionalism aspect. Yeah, is, it, is this I, just to uh, make sure the other team doesn't get um, tiebreaker points? Uh, or that, or may I? I'm thinking it's mainly like, all right, throw a match to make it seem look like to every other team scouting that you stink or that you've got uh, really some something wrong with your robot. But the number one seed or whoever's going to pick you knows that your robot works perfectly fine. and You're doing it purposely. Is that I, not I directly against the rules in FTC? Because it's directly it against is. the rules in FRC. I think it, it is, is directly against the rules, but it's hard, impossible to prove. <clears throat> they did prove it one one competition last year in Israel, I think, for FRC, but. Oh, it's is that not... why that second seed guy got like dismissed that time? I think so. I, think I don't. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but like, I think throwing matches is just completely against the spirit of first. Gracious professionalism is all about bringing your best and letting everybody else play at their best as well. And so I think that don't throw the match if you think that maybe you're not going to do as well as you want. Um, or maybe you think that you're scoring so much and you want to be a little conservative. There's always ways that you can reduce the amount that you're scoring, but still play at your best. And I think that um, sometimes, yeah, we'll play a weird strategy just to try it out and to play it as best as we can. But we just want to try it out to figure out whether it's going to work or not in the finals or something like that. So for those cases, I think that it's fine. But just going out there and not doing anything is just against the spirit of first. Yeah, no, I agree with you. If you want to switch your strategy up a little bit, that's to I mean, totally fine by me. I mean, my team in NSR last year ran, I think, our first like six matches at the front crypto box. And then we realized, oh, wait, we're not going to get picked at the front crypt as a robot to run front crypto. Let's run back. And we did back the next three matches and did just as fine. And 
I mean, that's just showing essentially showing off your abilities. I don't think, yeah, showing yeah. Uh, switching strategy is an issue, but definitely throwing matches is not cool. Though, I don't see any way where someone could prove it unless they have a recording of you saying it, or if you're running around the pit like, oh my god, we just threw a match, which is, <laughs> which I don't know why you do that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think about tiebreaker points and scoring tiebreaker points by scoring from the opponent alliance? Oh, tiebreaker points are, t- are totally fine. RP RP dumps are like uh, are a backbone of first or a backbone of FTC from like uh, for for me for years, right? Like I remember in Cascade Effect, there were teams trying that uh, trying to <laughs> get those points. Uh, so I mean, I don't think that that's on GP in any way, shape, or form. Like tiebreaker points, it's just it's a flawed system in my opinion. But that's a whole nother bag to open. But uh, this is just the way to solve that flawed system, or this is a, just a way to get past it and do the best that your team possibly can. So it's yeah, usually sure, exists uh, in FRC, by the way, where you could score for the other alliance, and that would be part of the tiebreaker. And there was a year back in 2010 where you could actually uh, essentially rig matches that way by having everybody just pile onto one alliance, and then they change rules for that in the future. Mm. Um, Rig demotes in the chat. Yeah. Um, Yeah, Shashir, (laughs) I was just going off what you said. Um, uh, I feel like scoring tiebreaker points is definitely a strategic move, especially since uh, you may have multiple multiple teams that win all their matches, but then they might have different tiebreaker points, and then they'd be ranked differently. And it's not really fair if they're all, you know, really good. Absolutely. Yeah. My team does this in league, in Chicago League, every year. Every year. For the last yeah. three years that we, we've done it. In VV one year, we had a 1v0 match. It was just us. No one in the other alliance. So we got <laughs> ended up getting three of the four beacons. We got most of the... Uh, Part, uh, I forgot what they're called. The min- particles scored. Is that what they're called? I don't even know. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's um, right. Particles scored. Like, I mean, it happens all the time. And yeah, it should, it's fine if it happens. You're helping out the other alliance in a that's way. That's right. <laughs> it's very <Kind> GP. <laughs> <laughs> and there are definitely ways to be not GP about it. Like, a big thing to avoid is telling the other alliance that you're going to do it beforehand. That's pretty bad. But yeah. in most cases, it's pretty good. I think, yeah, definitely. I know I've heard of times where people tell the other alliance, like, hey, you guys, like, if, it, if it's, like, a tighter game, it's like, hey, we want to score for you, so, like, sort of stay out of your, the like, the way. And that's obviously, like, that's you're crossing that line and just shooting past that line, and that's totally not okay. But definitely for, um, if, it's, if it's something that just happens cycle-wise and it's something that needs to be done without any malicious intent or anything, it's just you're trying to get the most points in the best ranking you can, no, no problems at all. I think this year also, for alliance selection in general, there's a lot more collaboration that's required compared to any previous year. Last year, the team that could play far, CryptoBox, could also play close, or close could usually play far. The year before, anybody could shoot. The year before that, anybody could score either mid or high if mm-hmm. they were getting picked up like the world championship level. Um, and so I think this year, being able to play Depot is having a completely different robot than being able to play Crater in a lot of the cases. And a lot of the Crater-only robots have a harder time playing Depot. And so I think there's going to be a lot more strategy about pairing up with teams that you complement rather than pairing up with teams that are just good. And that's going to lead to some more strategy during the alliance selection. Mm-hmm. And I, I, personally, I feel like we've exhausted most of this conversation. Um, so I guess I'll throw another loop here: is what do you guys think about if you're re- if we're ready to move on? What do we think about eight alliances per division at Worlds? I think that eight alliances for divisions at Worlds is just like a band aid to the bigger problem, which is um, our current ranking system. It just needs a little bit of improvement. I mean. Adding having eight alliances per division at Worlds, yeah, it would probably allow every single team that deserves to get picked to get picked. But I think in order to allow every team to get picked that deserves to get picked, um, one of the ways, like a lot of the FTC games have become very offensive. And I know first global, um, it was also a very offensive game, no defense allowed. And the way they did their rankings was based off of how many points you scored. And I think if FTC switched to a similar system like that, that would allow teams to be rewarded for doing offensive things instead of just hurting teams for playing defense or offense. 
That's so. it's such a simple solution, right? Like, I don't understand why it's so hard for first to just understand that, like, the game is made for a team to score points. And the ranking should be how many points has that team scored. Like, it's a very simple metric. It's something I believe that FRC uses, right? It's one of the first uh, tiebreakers after you do the, um, like, the, all the ranking point stuff. Um, but, like, I think that that's just such a simple way to solve this issue. But uh, it's unfortunately not happening. Well, now, now that you've brought that up, um, what do you guys think about an objective-based ranking system similar to FRC? I don't know if Tyler wants to weigh in here, but if you guys don't know, in FRC, they've got uh, four RP every match, two for winning, uh, one for a tie, zero for a loss, and then an additional two. I, th I think it's always two every year, right? You can't, there's never more than two. It has been for the last few years, yes. And so, like, for last year, if you did, if you, uh, did something in autonomous, uh, if everyone essentially did autonomous, you got a rank point. I can't remember what the tally up one was for. And then this year, uh, one is for every everyone climbing or going onto their hab and then another one for filling a rocket yeah so so it's for either one completed rocket or receiving 15 points or more on the habitat so you don't actually have to have all three robots so you could have one robot uh, one robot on level three and one one robot on level one or higher and that would actually accomplish a rank point um something that just add context while you guys describe this too is that uh this year and i think last year is the same but in previous years it's been different uh, the rank points don't translate in the playoffs at all in FRC. When they first kind of started back in, like, if you look at, like, 2016 or something like that, uh, you could still do what the rank points were worth, but then they just translate into more playoff points. So maybe another uh, curveball there, too. Interesting. Yeah. I would be fine with ranking points. Um, FTC games make it a little tough. Like, last year I would have been fine with, like, one Cypher and two Relics being a ranking point. This would... This year is kind of tough. Maybe like two samples in a hang or something. I actually, right. yeah, I am. I'm actually not uh, too much of a fan of that because I also like for me at least, I want a ranking to be like, what can your robot do, right? If your robot can do a lot, you get a higher ranking, and maybe you're gonna boost your alliance partner at the same time. But okay, that's that's just inevitable. But for me, the thing that I just dis dislike a lot about the, the ranking point system is how it requires robots to do things. Um, it requires all the robots to do things, sorry. Um, and that, once again, it brings you back to, okay, you're relying on other people for your rank. And I just absolutely don't dislike that. Um, I believe it was, uh, what was it, in 20... Um, what was what were the ranking points in Steamworks again? Uh, I think it was, it was fuel and it was ah for fuel. Yeah, okay. Never mind. That, that, that's right. That's that's a different thing. So last year you had to, I believe, fuel all gears. three robots had to cross the line in auto, right? To get I liked right? that a lot. Did you really like that? I actually didn't like that because that required if you have an alliance partner that could literally do nothing you lose an entire ranking point because they can't drive the, even in a straight line. The spirit of it was to encourage teams to work together where they would help other teams make them have autonomous pretty much. So, and they, yeah. not only do they have the cross line autonomous, but you have to at least have uh, one cube placed in your switch as well too. That, that's right. That's right. I, I know the, the cube and the switch part, but the problem was all three, my problem with that was all three robots had to have crossed that line because now you're relying on, you're relying on essentially that all three robots work. And unfortunately that's not something that can happen. And your ranking is unf unfairly diminished because of that. And I feel like if we bring a system, bring that, that kind of system into FTC, we have to be really careful about making sure that if a robot can do well, they will rank higher than a robot that can't do well just because they can achieve the accomplishments they need to achieve. All right, what, so, what if you could just think, like solo it though? Like how, how like this year where if you complete a rocket, you get a rank point in FRC, uh, you don't need multiple robots to do it. It definitely helps, but you don't need it. Oh, no, no, absolutely. That's exactly what I was saying I would like, right? I wouldn't want it to – I want it to be if, – if that was to be implemented in FTC, it has to be implemented very carefully because if it's something like this year's – like the, the rocket stuff, if it's something like Ethan was saying, right, a, a cipher double relic for last year, right, that's chill because a team can do that. A team just has to be really good to do that. Um, but, like, I just don't want it to be something that relies on every single robot on the field. That has I to actually be. disagree oh. with that. Okay. Yeah, so it, the reason why I disagree is um, when we go to a competition, I mean, a lot of the time you have the entire morning to scout out teams and figure out who can do what. And because moving forward in autonomous is such a simple task, I think that 
it's a good way to bring together some of the veteran teams with some of the rookie teams and teach rookie teams how to make autonomous because whether we like it or not, in FTC, autonomous just isn't that popular. And teams wait till the last minute to program their autonomous because it's not weighted as heavily in a lot of the games. In Velocity Vortex, it was weighted very heavily. And so a lot of teams had autonomous as early. But like last year and this year, it's not weighted as heavily as it's been in the past. And a lot of rookie teams just feel like they don't have the capabilities to do it. And so having a ranking point task like that, I think would increase collaboration between the teams and it would just make the FTC community stronger as a whole. But that's a fair point. with something like two parks, like something yeah. that is easily cheese capable. Um, yeah. Mm, I'm totally. cool with that. Or two samples. I still like going back because you could just double sample or you can mm-hmm. help your alliance partner or whatever. So yeah, two, I, two samples actually sounds really nice. It's like, two it's samples that, it's, would be- so actually, Sean, I guess I, I agree with you more than I do with Ashir, Shashir because um, if you have to work together in autonomous to score RP points, I guess that would bring the community closer together because now teams would have to help each other get a working autonomous exactly. instead That's of just one I think, team. Yeah. I think <laughs> I first think is perfect. all about rookie teams and teaching rookie teams. So by making it so then every rookie team has to have an autonomous, using the RP method, it would really make the entire first community stronger. Well, and if you uh, take, I mean, they're one of the best teams in the world, 254, the Cheesy Poops and FRC, for example. If you look at last year, I'm now, I just pulled up their Blue Alliance page. And if you're, I'm looking at their rank points, they got two rank points in almost, or four total in almost every single match uh, they had last season. Uh, and they all, I mean, they also went, went undefeated. Their robot was amazing. But um, if you look at their but, first tournament. If you look first... at their first tournament, though, they had one, two, three for five out of their nine matches that they had two rank points and i tyler you, i'm sure you might know more this more about this than me but i heard at one point that um they had code for essentially every single operating system or like a, a code system and uh, a ton of different styles of like drivetrains that they would give to teams and say here we want to work with you we want you to be better I mean, that's mainly we want you to be better so we can be better. But whatever the motivation is, it's helping everyone. So I don't, I don't but know exactly really, the case. Is that really G? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I don't know if that's, a, you know, I don't, I don't know yes or no if that's exactly the case. What I can tell you, in FRC, it is very common at a competition to see multiple teams with uh, additional crew whose sole job is to go out and help other teams become ready for competition. And so, so Nathan, you and I were just at Chicago, right at the Midwest regional for FRC Mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. And there was a team from the Netherlands that showed up and their robot did not clear customs. They did not have a robot at being competition. Wild Sting, who's a hall of fame team, which a topic to come up with a little bit. Good segue there uh, is, you know, comes out and says, you know what? We have a practice robot. Use our robot. We'll help you build it, get it in the competition shape and their robot ended up coming day two, but for day one, they got to compete instead of not being able to compete at all. And I think, you know, I don't know how that, you know, I'm newer to FTC, right? So uh, I, I don't know if that's the culture in FTC as well, but it's definitely the culture in FRC that, you know, let, let's let's make it fair play and beat them on the field and when everybody's at their best ability they can be. Mm-hmm. Totally, we had yeah. A match, we had a match in Velocity Vortex where we cheesecaked our alliance partner's auto so we just wrote them an auto to drive forward and hit the cap ball. Um, and then they ended up being an alliance captain and picked a really good team and then beat us in finals running the auto we wrote for them. But <laughs> I, I like that. I mean, I'd rather see them do that than see them go last place because they didn't have an auto because they didn't work. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, like I know in scouting, what happens is when we get to a competition, our drive team gets inspected and, and then our scouters are going around looking for teams that don't have an auto because Programming and block programming is so easy nowadays, and teams can easily program an auto that just goes straight into the crater or straight into the depot or just delatches. Like teams don't have an auto to just delatch, even though they have a hang mechanism on their robot. It's just like simple things like that. They could get a free 30 points by just writing auto code that moves their motor for time. And I think that being able to bring the community together is going to be very important in the future for first. So. I, get, I think we found a great transition, or Tyler provided us with a great transition. So I think we're going to move on to talk about ins- the Inspire Awards uh, and uh, kind of should those teams uh, get Hall of Fame status. But before we do that, I think we're going to give away our 24 to 1 uh, 
uh, ratio worm gear set courtesy of GoBuilda. And actually, I don't think this, I don't know if this was said, but you're going to get two of those. So if you win, you're going to get two of those 24 to 1 ratio worm gear sets. And the keyword is do the worm, all one word, do the worm. So definitely type that in the chat so you can get your chance to win. Do the uh, uh, O, as I just typed it in. Uh, I didn't know that worm had a U in it. Uh, sorry, Tyler asked, Tyler asked me if uh, that was uh, do the worm with a U or an O. Uh, so that is my weird comment that you don't really hear. Um, so, all right, so while everyone types that in the chat, let's move on. So, um, I mean, we have an Inspire Award winning team here. Uh, uh, Sean, uh, Wizards.exe won Inspire last year for everyone that does not know. So um, should Inspire winners get Hall of Fame status and get an auto bid to Worlds, uh, this is how it's been. The Chairman's winner in FRC at Worlds has gotten Hall of Fame status, and then they get to go to Champs every single year, I think for the rest of their existence, right? Um, so currently, um, I wouldn't personally be shocked if that changed at some point with the amount of teams that they're going to have winning Hall of Fame. But um, what do you guys think of that? Should we adapt that to FTC? If we do, should we change something else about the awards process? Um, what do you guys think? I think there's really two ways that you can look at this. Uh, first, just to give a little bit of a history of the Inspire Award winners. Um, there's been, I think, 15 Inspire Award winners so far. Um, and that's including the two at Detroit and Houston for the past few years. and only three of them are competing at the world championship this year, as far as I'm aware of. And so I think that in FRC, I, it would definitely bring more Inspire Award winners to FTC Worlds if they did give Hall of Fame um, privileges. But one of those other things is a lot of the Inspire Award teams are not as sustainable. So um, I know that there's only about six teams that have won the Inspire Award that are still currently participating in FTC. And so I think that, yeah, while the teams aren't as sustainable, just giving Hall of Fame status to those six teams wouldn't really change worlds that much. It would only add three more teams, which they could easily add in. And it would somewhat recognize the efforts of these teams because it is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Well, so... I guess I'll jump in. I know I did ask the question. I personally really love a Hall of having a Hall of Fame. Um, but kind of my caveat that uh, I know a few of you might agree with is if we're going to do Hall of Fame, and I know some people in chat agree with me, then I think that we for uh, FTC should get rid of the um, one year, I guess, like rule limit on how far back you can talk about your outreach in a judging presentation. Because um, I think if we're going to, if first wants to make Inspire something like really big and awesome and something that's kind of a permanent, like you won, now you get this great thing of coming to champs every year. You need to make that for the history of the team. I know for my team, we do a lot of stuff. We don't do a whole lot of stuff concentrated within a year, but if you look at what we've done over, I guess, say my, for example, my four years in the team, we've done quite a lot. It's not, it's all happened over a period of time incrementally. Um, but sadly that doesn't all count just what's happened since last time, since last world championship. Absolutely. I, I, I think I agree with that. I, I, my, my, my logic is this. It's like FTC, the Inspire Award for FTC is fundamentally different than the Chairman's Award for FRC in the sense that Chairman's is looking at the team's overall contribution to the community over their like lifetime. I guess like I do, it's like 10 years and then five years and they, they're like, there are caveats. It's not, it's five, five years. Okay. Yeah. I remember I, I was doing that like a while ago, but uh, like last year. Um, but you had to, um, you had to, like, you have five years versus the Inspire Award being just what you can do in this year. And because the Inspire Award is just your single year's contribution, then you, the Inspire Award doesn't, I feel, the Inspire Award as is doesn't merit um, recognition or doesn't merit you becoming a Hall of Fame team for more than just a year. Or, like, it doesn't, it doesn't get you to Worlds more than just the year you got the Inspire Award because of the way that the award is structured. But I think that the Hall of Fame is important. I think that it will really um, elevate the impact that FTC teams can have because now 
all of these teams who are competing for the Inspire Award are have expanded their scope. They're not thinking, what can I do between April and April, right? What can I what it's not what can I do between world champs to world champ? It's what can I do, what can I do to make a sustained impact? And I think that giving this hall of, like changing what the Inspire Award means and giving this Hall of Fame status to a select few teams, like the teams that win the Inspire Award, will allow first as a whole and will allow FTC teams as a whole to do so much more for their communities. But I think also a big thing is teams aren't just focused on April to April. I know personally for my team, I don't know how it is for other teams. Personally for my team, we don't focus on April to April. The April to April deadlines are just there for what we talk about during the presentation. A lot of our things are multi-year programs, and we just talk about what we did during that year. So even though it's a multi-year program, we do mention it during judging that we've been doing it for multiple years. And then we try to focus on what we've been doing that year because I think it is important for them to recognize that year's contribution. Otherwise, a team that had students, that all those students have graduated out because in FTC, that's very common. Um, all the students have graduated out and then a completely new set of students are there and they're just talking about what the old students did. And that can lead to like teams getting the Inspire Award when they really don't deserve it. Um, the way the Inspire Award is structured right now, it also allows rookie teams to have somewhat of an opportunity to get it. And there are definitely some rookie teams that deserve it. I mean, they're definitely doing more outreach than a lot of the veteran teams and they're really creating an impact. Um, so I actually don't have a problem with it being a one-year thing and just judging on that one year. The thing that I'm really iffy about, as I think some people in chat have been saying, is a lot of these teams just aren't sustainable. But that may not necessarily be a bad thing when giving um, Hall of Fame status, since if the team isn't sustainable, they'll just die away, and it's not really going to be changing the effects of worlds because there's going to be a very limited number of teams that are actually getting affected by Hall of Fame status. So, uh, Ishan, do you think that uh, giving Hall of Fame status to these teams would actually increase their longevity and um, help it definitely them stay could. as teams? Right, I, because I, I feel I like think it, it definitely could. I think it would. Mm -hmm. I it mean, if you would, too. And I'm going to mostly agree with Ishan on this one. Um, I like that it's one year. I like that as a freshman, I can go onto my team and make an impact on a team who hasn't done any outreach in the past and win an Inspire Award that year. That's really huge to me because I think it really fits with the theme of everything is year to year. Um, with that, I don't think that I like the idea of Hall of Fame um, because I don't know if giving a team a ride to champs is the way is a good way to encourage sustainability in programs. Um, if it were me, I would rather see the Connect Award focus more on sustainability. Um, if that's maybe moving Motivate to being more outreach focused and Connect being more sustainability focused, I think that could be a better way to do it. But just giving a team who did really well one season a ticket to champs forever isn't really my thing. Let me ask um, a quick question for you. Yeah. Is, is the contention you guys have that there shouldn't be anything called the Hall of Fame in the first place? Or is it because you're making a connection to how FRC is where they're getting a free ride, the champs, not a free ride, but I mean, in FRC, they've earned it, right? Like they're defined as they have earned their ticket to champs every year. So is the main point of contention that uh, you don't want FTC teams to automatically qualify for championships every, every year? Or is it just the fact of having a Hall of Fame in general? I think it's I mean, the, there already is a Hall of Fame, right? Like if you look it up, there is like. No. Oh, it's gosh. not been updated since 2015. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> but I think the main contention is an auto. Uh, the main point of discussion is an auto go to worlds. I wouldn't. Okay, I would actually. It'd be great if first on their website would have a list of the Inspire winners and the winning alliance and finalist alliance at each championship mm -hmm. since FTC started in 2006. That'd be great. It's great for the team to be able to say, "Hey, I did this." It's great for when going to sponsors say, "Hey, we're up on the website." I think the the, the more conversation is. Once you do that, should you go to champs either at least for the next year? Should you go to champs for the rest of your team's existence? And I mean, yeah. And I, I disagree with you, Ethan, in the in the whole outreach and only. I disagree with everyone who says that outreach only lasts for a year or be counted for a year. Um, even though I was in the same experience as you were, Ethan, my freshman year, I joined the team and I'm like, outreach, where? And everyone's like, yeah, we don't do outreach. I'm like, well, that's an issue. We need to fix that, uh, which we did, but. Last year at 
uh, Illinois State, and the team that I'm about to not mention their name, but talk about, I love them. They're amazing. They do awesome things. They won the State Inspire Award as a rookie team. I can't remember how their team got formed, but I believe it was a uh, some other members had joined the team, so they had past first experience. But it was a little bit like, it was. I felt a little bit inside weird because I'm like, if a team has been around a year, how can you do as much as a team like mine, for example? We're not the best example, though. But like, how can you do as much as a team who's been around for 10 years, five years, four years, uh, who's been doing outreach and connecting with companies for a long time, but you just joined the program like six months ago and, and did a bunch of things. Now you're winning a State Inspire Award. So I mean, I personally would love to jump to the FRC model, or maybe I should just go do FRC. Um, <laughs> But of Mm -hmm. don't get your rookie year, but maybe we do have like a rookie all-star at States where the best rookie gets to go on. But that's a whole host, another discussion for another day. I think Um, we're also focusing a lot on the community aspect portion of the Inspire Award. It's not just community outreach. Like it's clear that the Inspire Award is the role model team that does both community outreach and robot. And yeah, we probably don't have the best community outreach in the world and we don't have the best robot in the world. But I think a part of the reason why we were the Inspire Award winners was because we had a little bit of a merge of both. And I think that we're really looking past that and we're just talking about the community outreach. And by making it also a part of the robot, it's impossible for it to be a multi-year thing because the robot only lasts a year. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That is a difference. Um, but I actually do want to just uh, jump into this conversation here. So we're talking about how the Inspire Award should advance teams. What do you guys think about the winning alliance of worlds and moving on, like to uh, like auto admitting to next year's worlds? Like, what do you guys think about that? It yes. would have made a difference this year. It w- it would have made a difference every year almost. Yeah, I remember last year eighty six fifty one didn't make. Oh wor- well, no, they did actually. Never mind. Uh, Never mind. Uh, totally. Sure. Yes. I think if you win, you should go for at least the next year. Same with Inspire. Um, not everyone's, I, I think at least for the next year, you should, you should go if you win and are the Inspire winner. Um, yeah. But I, I guess like the, the, the oh, you can go, go ahead. I like that it's yearly. Like realistically, a lot of the times a world's winning alliance doesn't advance to champs the next year is because a lot of their team graduated and not because they got cheated out of advancing. And if it yeah. were, if it felt like to me that a lot of times people who won worlds got cheated out of advancing, I'd feel differently, but it's realistically a lot of times just because they had graduates and if half your team graduates and that's all you're about people. But that, hard year. I, um, yeah. So, uh, I guess one one of the biggest counter arguments I've seen to that is that if somebody is automatically admitted to Worlds, they might just slack off the next year, like not do as much outreach, not put as much effort into the robot. Um, and I'm not sure how that works in FRC. I guess what what do you guys think about that? So real quick, that is an absolutely for FRC at least an absolutely crazy comment to make. There is no way that a team that has worked their butts off to qualify to get that is going to work any less hard the next year. I think yeah. it's I mean, sort of the yeah. same way with FTC. I mean, I know I can only speak on behalf of our team. Um, we're not doing anything less. We're doing more than we could last year. We're trying our best. And I know also 3595, Schrodinger's hat, they're doing as best as they can. And so we're all trying to stay at that level. And it's a very hard level to stay at. And it's just very difficult to maintain that. But we all are trying our best to stay there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, but uh, yeah, I just go back to thinking if you're going to Worlds next year, that just acts as a bigger motivator. I mean, if my team was a World Inspire winner and we got to go every single year, I know that personally, I mean, if I were to able to still, if I could still continue on the team personally, I'd say, all right, guys, now we're going to Worlds every year. Let's one, build the best robot possible, ignore the engineering notebook, and try to help as many teams in Chicago. Because I know that that's one thing that's definitely needed, at least in my region, is a team to like, not care is the wrong word, but to spend less time on their team and their robot and their notebook and to spend more time teaching other teams. But is that um, necessarily a bad thing? 
I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, as I've said, I really yeah. want there to be like a continue on, like a kind of an, uh, a it hall would of just fame give incentive. It would just give incentive to all the other teams, uh, or it would give incentive to the Inspire Award to do stuff that they wouldn't be able to earlier. Yeah, I think it's, it it's would, a motivator to me. Yeah. And then um, there was one more thing. There's also the small parts about the Hall of Fame, which, like, in FRC, they have all of the banners of the teams that have won and an entire, like, nice dedicated section. What do you guys think about having that for the FTC Hall of Fame winners? That'd be, that'd be cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it would be cool, but I don't think it's too, um, it's, I'm too big of a deal for that, for, like, yeah. what, what this should really be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, so I think we're going to draw for that first giveaway. Tyler? Oh, no All right, worries. so, yeah. So, once again, we're giving away uh, two of the 24 to 1 uh, ratio worm gear sets uh, that we're going to be putting up on screen for a second. So, if you're interested in winning that, you have to type in. Uh, it was, uh, what was it, guys? Do the worm, right? Yeah, do the worm. With do an O and not word. a U. I don't know why you asked that, so. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do that drawing, and we're going to start the uh, second one right away, right away after that, too. Uh, the winner is going to be uh, Turbo Charge. Gets the, ah. uh, gets the uh, 24 to 1 ratio worm gear set. Lots of rigged emotes in chat. Turbo Charge is a uh, subscriber, so we have clearly rigged it for Turbo Charge to win. Uh, but please make sure you reach out to First Updates now, uh, either on uh, our, my Twitch account here uh, or in our Discord, uh, and let me know your mailing information, which means we need your first name, last name, mailing address, city, zip code. All the fun stuff like that. Uh, so congratulations on that. And then we're actually going to start our next giveaway uh, right away. Can somebody talk about a little bit what this uh, U Channel bundle is? Yep. So the next giveaway is the uh, 1120 series U Channel bundle. Um, so it's essentially Go Build this version of the Tetrix channel. Uh, it's big, nice, thick channel. I know that there's a bunch of FR, or not a bunch, a good handful of FRC teams that are using Go Build a. Um, U channel on their robots, uh, so it's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, looks like Mike wants to win this one, maybe for his FRC team. Um, so the keyword for this is U. When I was, uh, it's eight U's by the way. You can just copy it from me posting it in chat. The Soldier Boy. When I was trying to think of a uh, of a keyword, Soldier Boy's song "Crank That" came into my mind when I was thinking of a pun about U. So there you go. All right, so type that in the chat. Uh, don't forget, if you'd like to win, you have to make sure you click the follow button to be following our channel, stay up to date on all of our cool shows that we have here on uh, First Updates Now. And if you do choose to subscribe, help support the stream. We rely 100% on the community to support us. You'll get five times luck to win. You can just do, do so for free through Twitch Prime or for just a few bucks a month. And thank you, everybody, for your support, and good luck in this next giveaway. Um, so I think our next topic that we're going to jump into is the impact of two champs. Um, so how do you guys think the two champs has impacted FTC? Uh, do you like it? If you've been to the one champs and you've been to now two champs, is it better or worse? If you go back to one champs, what's everyone's thoughts? I definitely really don't like it because I, I feel like, uh, having two different championships, if you are the winner or if you're the winning Alliance captain or the inspire award winner, it's not really that you're the world champion anymore you're like half a champion <laughs> that's fair I, I i i mean i would agree with that right like this is a, a horse that's been beat i guess multiple times even through frc like it's nobody likes it i don't think i don't think that well i mean okay so nobody likes it in terms of the competition right i personally definitely don't prefer it right i i one of my favorite memories was going to um go was going to the uh, union station in in rescue and literally just fangirling over 6081 over i squared um it's just like just seeing that beautiful robot talking to them um but that's just an experience that i i can't have anymore um and I, of course i think that's something similar that happens right none of you guys can meet rednecks none of you guys can meet data force um it's just it's 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 disappointing that we just can't uh have that level, level of connection and stratification um uh due to this due to this due, basically due to two champs so i'll play devil's advocate here i think that actually two champs has made first a little bit better um, first reason is they already had supers, which felt like a championship and it was structured like a championship and it cost teams an extra thousand dollars to go to and more because 
pit set up, all of that stuff. And so I think that that definitely cost teams and limited the accessibility to teams that, while they may have been good, I know I personally know some teams that couldn't go to Supers or couldn't go to Worlds because of resources um, back when it was only one Worlds and there were four Supers. Um, and since first goal is to give more teams that championship experience, and I completely agree with that. I think that it's impossible to go to championship and get worse. Like teams that go to championship for the first time, they're going to get exponentially better because they're going to see all these awesome teams and get inspired by them. Um, and then also, I think that with two worlds, even though, yeah, there's no one Inspire Award winner or one winning alliance, it just if you think about it as just two supers and it just ends at two supers, it just makes it seem like, yeah, you're giving more teams championship experience and you're letting teams still meet and get inspired by some of the top teams. So I think in first perspective and in my perspective, it's just improving the community of first even though it's not recognizing the top most teams. Exactly. So I think it's really the question of, um, do we want to make the experience better for everyone, or do we want to make that make it uh, bring it back to what it what like the roots of first and the roots of FTC is, which is a competition. And I totally agree that first is about inspiring students to get STEM education and get STEM experience. And for that, two championships is way better. But as a competitor, right, as someone who's been a part of this program, uh, a large part of it has been really uh, creating the best robot I can to, to win or to do well. That's a bit disappointing for me. So two sides of the coin, of course, from first perspective, the two champs is definitely going to be considered a success. Mm -hmm. Logistically, yeah. it does make sense. Like FTC has a huge issue, if you ask me, about just not enough teams advance from every level a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Like, absolutely, two state. So, my favorite personal solution would be going back to one champs and having eight super regionals, or even having eight super regionals with two champs, um, mm -hmm. and just being able to double the number of teams who advance from every state. Or if I, you implement the district model, that could help too. Mm, yeah, um, that, that could help. That's that's a, that's another can that we have to open, and that <laughs> is. It has its. Uh, I mean, okay. District system has benefits and drawbacks. I think I really, I like how um, it really does weigh robot performance a lot more. But then again, that goes against like the FTC's fundamental pre pre like preference of weighing awards so much more. So like mm -hmm. you're if you're doing a district based model, right? If you're doing the FRC type, uh, where like um, just for the audience who doesn't know, districts is basically where like you have a set of ranking points, like you rank based on how high you seed, how uh, what alliance captain slash what alliance you pay, pay, you're uh, paired with, and what um, how uh, what awards you get. But like and so like doing that, like basically diminishing awards from being a direct advancement slot to being just a part, a very tiny part of your advancement. Um, I think that that just sort of detracts from what first and what FTC is really trying to focus on. So what, you could easily so, change the weighting on that. You could easily make it so then awards and robot are weighed equally. Like, yeah, that's true. That's just then the way FRC weird, is structured. You can have weird chances in that point, or you can have weird circumstances where like the entire winning alliance doesn't advance, stuff like yeah. that. If you yes. have like three slots and just a ton and that already of happens. teams win a lot of awards, that's so, true true so i'll get my kind of two cents in personally i don't care if it's two champs or one champs what i think that ftc needs is what now there's 160 at each championships so that's 320 total mm -hmm. doing my math right yes um i think we need to double the amount of teams just overall going to championship for ftc so at least 200 each championship if not 250 i think 250 would be awesome in each championship you're going to greatly increase the number of teams that can qualify out of each state uh, you can greatly increase the number of international teams that come because I know that some uh, international um, events only have one qualifier spot. And uh, oh god, who is, I was talking with someone I can't remember who recently, um, but oh, I was talking with a team uh, at the Midwest Regional. I was talking about someone who does FTC in England, mm -hmm. and they said that they only have one mm -hmm. uh, qualifier qualifying spot at the England Championship, and it's for the Inspire Award. So it doesn't matter at all what happens on the field. You could have a horrible robot, but do as much outreach and great engineering as, as you can and win an award. Uh, to me, that's a little bit of a crapshoot. Like, 
why? What's the point at that point? It's just a science fair. The entire um, award does have a clause in the description that says match performance is taken into account. Yes. Yes, but it you don't have to be the best robot. You have to be yeah. like in the top half. Yes. Which is, yeah. So it, the biggest part of that is doing what you say you can do and being consistent. Like there's a pretty famous at this point YouTube video of the world's judge advisor saying that robot performance, how well you perform is not a criteria according to him. And I can tell you that it is. And as I, uh, I shouldn't do this, but at the, also at the Midwest regional, I talked to like the assistant judge advisor or someone and I kind of pressed them as like, Hey, why didn't we win any awards? Um, and she was like, and I, or it wasn't that generic. It was a, did our match performance, uh, cause we didn't perform amazingly, uh, during quals, uh, knock us down in terms of, uh, awards. And she was like, no, we didn't, we didn't look at the rankings. We didn't really care. We saw how your robot performed like the first three matches and then just talked the rest of the day. Um, but on the district model, uh, essentially for qualifying for states, that's super interesting. I'm actually, maybe this weekend, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll do it at some point. I'll go back and uh, look at all of the qualifier results for Illinois and calculate a district uh, district rankings to see who would have made it to state, and I will report back as to if that impacted anything. See, um, also with the district model, you could merge states. So instead of having eight supers, you could just have eight districts and no state championship. So... Every team just feeds into it. There's every team gets two district event plays, and that all feeds into a district championship. And those eight district championships go straight to worlds. Actually, that would be pretty sweet. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think that would be one way to help alleviate. It would still give a lot of teams an opportunity to go to a quote unquote championship, but it would also help make sure that only the top teams are going. That'd be a drastic change, but that would be pretty sweet. Yeah. That would be pretty sweet. Um, so I think Tyler has some thoughts on this topic, if he wants to jump in. Yeah, so a, a proposal I want to give to you, and this is something that I would love to see FRC do, because I always hear both sides of, like, more teams should go and there should be a champion. So how do we sell something like that? And to me, the answer is to do exactly what Vex is doing currently right now, where they have one championship and they just have many more teams there, but they split up how it works. So if you look at... Um, uh, Vex IQ versus Vex for Box competition, they just make those two separate championships, but they just run consecutively. So to me, like, so like you were saying, for example, why not? Why can't we have 500 FTC teams all come to Detroit, St. Louis, Houston, whatever city you pick uh, for something like that, and you guys get your own championship for FTC? Because to me, when I go, and as somebody who is you know really from FRC, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't want to pay attention to what goes on in FTC most of the time there. How many people are actually moving between the different ones? And honestly, if you've ever seen the FLL one, it's a freaking joke. Like, there are people standing on concrete floors looking up at screens watching their kids play. They don't even get, like, bleachers to, stand, to sit in or anything like that. So, like, I, I think the way that the FTC champs were done last year, uh, especially at, at Detroit pops in my head, like, the way the bleachers were set up was very nice. I think it's it was a good setup for it. But why not just... Make it so FTC gets their own championship for things. And that way, FTC gets brought more into the spotlight. It quits being this, this like stepchild of what FRC is all the time. And it provides you guys that limelight that I think you truly deserve. I think Absolutely. that's what Supers was. Supers, exactly. so many people liked it because it was just FTC. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, make, so large... make championships that way. Yeah, yeah exactly. I agree. Super regionals were a large, marketable, fun ftc focused event that like had had such high production quality it was just it was a fun event to be in because you're not being constantly overshadowed by the big robots you're not being constantly overshadowed by like and you're not being constantly put down by team like by teams by by bigger frc teams who are like oh wow that's a joke why like in the middle of minute Maid, it's like oh okay so we have our bathroom break when the ftc matches are going on right like it's it's sort of we're, like if if ftc has its own like the segment, if it's if it's its own thing, I think it would be so much more of an enjoyable experience for FTC students as a whole. It'll make worlds so much more enjoyable. Well, same for FLL. I know that yeah. uh, my school's FL, one of my school's FLL teams went last year to Worlds, and they loved it. But they were like, the best part was watching FRC, and I was like, yeah. what do you that- think about your own area? And they were like, it was fine, but the best part was FRC finals. And I was like, yeah, I get that. Like, I was at FRC finals 2016, and it was amazing. Um, FRC Finals 2016 was awesome. 
But yeah, I went to FLL Worlds in 2015. And that was the first year that they had the dome only for FRC. And mm -hmm. it just felt like we were an afterthought. They put I mean, you guys in the pits, right? You were, you were like yeah, on the far, far in the pits. pits. It, was, it, was, yeah. it was disgusting. It was despicable that people traveled that far for that long for that type of experience. Like, it was incredible to meet the teams, but then when you saw the production quality of the place, we were just standing there and we were trying to see the robots, but since the tables are to your waist, you can't see anything. And the yeah. live stream sucks. I tried to watch the FFL live stream last year to see my team. Um, it's like a, it's just a camera like 30 feet like away from the table. You can't even yeah. see what's going on with the mission models, let alone like anything related to live scoring. Um, that's a whole nother like mm -hmm. live, uh, I mean, live scoring FLL would be pretty cool. FTC, it worked out pretty well this year, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I guess if, if Tyler has another minute to chat, what, what did everyone think about live scoring this year? Oh, I good. loved it. It was great. Uh, yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. And actually, this was the perfect year to introduce it because one of the things I think a lot of people are not noticing is how close the matches really are, especially when you're in that driver's box. You can't see how many minerals the opponents have scored. So being able to see, check that live score, yeah, it may not be the most accurate. Check it, see where you are, and use that to give yourself feedback as to how to drive next. It's been actually incredibly helpful. So Dan, uh, you guys are lucky. When we had live scoring, we couldn't actually see the live scores. They were just in front of the drivers. So like, they were they were they were still driving blind. But the thing that I love about it is it makes it so much less stressful because after a match, you're like, huh, we probably won that one. We're good. Or huh, we lost that one. We don't have to care about fixing the robot for the next like level, like into the finals or something. <laughs> it was like that's the part I love the most. The funniest thing for me, at least, was like in like uh, for like Oregon State for the final finals, like the interdivision finals. <laughs> the the every like the um the the like the, the 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 people who are running the tournament were like, all right, we want to increase the suspense, so we're turning off live scoring. But there was just a TV somewhere else, like closer to the pit, that still had the live scoring running. <laughs> so everyone actually went away from the field and just went to that TV <laughs> for That's the entire funny. time. It was one, actually one great. of one of the things that. I do wish they had a little bit more with live scoring was a little bit more guidelines on what equipment to buy. Um, I know at Maryland States, we had a little bit of a problem connecting eight tablets and connecting the eight ta uh, connecting two laptops plus another four laptops for pit displays and stuff like that. Um, so it, it worked incredibly well once we got it up and running, just we had to go out and buy a router during lunch. So um, <laughs> if I think it's a great first step and there's a little bit of improvement. They almost got it perfect, and it's just a little bit left, and they can get it perfect. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I know that uh, I've talked with some of the score, scoring guys before. They're definitely trying to work on documentation and stuff. And for anyone who's watching who might run events, what you need quickly is um, you need two tablets for each field. You need a router. You need an eight-port switch. If you have access to uh, Ethernet, all of that makes it easier. Uh, hardwire every single display on the field that's possible to hardwire. That's what I learned after month, after like hours and hours and hours of uh, learning by doing. Um, it was very stressful this year figuring it out, but I did. Um, yeah, live scoring was cool. I had a thought. Um, oh yes, uh, Cookie Hero uh, two eight nine said uh, FLL live when. Um, I mean, there's like 20,000 FLL teams, so that's a lot of mentors, a lot of parents, and a lot of students to watch our show. So if you know someone who wants to do FLL Live, reach out to Tyler. I doubt he'll want to take that on, but uh, it's something. I, if there's the audience for it, sure, but that's, you know, the, honestly, the younger ages we go, the tougher it is to get a live audience to watch. Yes. Yeah. Um, so any final comments from others? Oh, no, I think that we've, we've pretty much covered it. I think we're pretty right. good. Uh, something I want to highlight is we have the Maryland Tech Invitational, or MTI, coming up later this year. So the deadline to apply for that is March 23rd, and the Maryland Tech Invitational is an annual off-season tournament that celebrates the tech and FTC. It's for FTC teams only and focuses on robot, excellence in hardware, software, and drive team. So we encourage teams who have a strong game performance to apply, regardless of their advancement to Worlds. So getting in to MTI or not is all based on your robot performance. So you submit some stuff about it, and they look over your application. 
So MTI is an international two-day tournament where teams play nine qualifying matches. And then Alliance Selection semifinals is done a bit differently. Um, so they do a snake draft selection where it's one through four. And then they pick the eighth for their second pick. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, that will be streamed on First Updates Now, as Tyler threw in the chat. Um, so the Chicago Robotics Invitational is also happening this summer, uh, if we want to throw up a thing about that. Um, so the Chicago Robotics Invitational is an annual off-season event in its second year now. So the deadline to apply is May 15th. So you have a little while to decide, but please apply sooner as we really want to finalize the um, – uh, Nathan in the chat, I'll talk about KSS in a minute. Um, we really want to finalize the uh, team list as soon as possible. Uh, so teams will play six matches at CRI, uh, at least six matches actually, where they'll play in a heavily modified field in 3v3 matches. Uh, alliance selection will follow uh, where alliances of four teams will actually be um, created similar to FRC. It will be a snake draft. Um, the winning alliance members will receive banners, finalist alliance members will receive plaques, other awards will be given out via only pit interviews, no judge interviews. Um, so uh, go to fwparkerrobotics.org to check out the uh, modified field, the rules, and the game, and to apply. Uh, as we're kind of seeing right now on the screen, Tyler, if we can scroll up a little bit to look at that uh, field diagram more closely. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, two landers in the field, four craters, um, there's 12... Uh, 12 per alliance specific minerals in the, the field. Those are worth 20 points wherever they're scored in the field. Um, there is a uh, second. So as you see on each lander, there's three alliance specific zones and then a zone for the opposite alliance. Any minerals can be scored in that opposite zone and each mineral is scored um, 10 point each mineral score there's worth 10 points and there's some other special things related to end game so you can check it out apply it's really fun uh, i know josh's team will be at the event i believe so uh ethan's team will also be at the event uh sean maybe wizards will come i'm still trying to get, thank you about try, it still trying to get you guys to come um and then uh, the registration fee is 100 dollars for that that will be streamed on first updates now um i don't have all of the details but i know that the weekend after the Chicago Robotics Invitational, the KSS Robotics Turtle event will be streamed on, or it might be streamed on fun, it was last year, but that will be taking place uh, Saturday, July 27th at uh, Akron University in Akron, Ohio. Uh, so you can go to that website that is sitting in, that website link sitting in um, the chat to check it out and apply. So... There you go. That was a lot of words about a lot of invitational <laughs> events. Um, so we think we're gonna... for our giveaway? Yes. All right. All right, okay. so bring me, bring me hot. Yep. So, um, so we're going to give away the, uh, uh, once again, the Go Build a 1120 Series U Channel Bundle. Uh, so very excited about that. Thanks again to Go Build a for all the amazing giveaways. If you didn't type the eight U's in, now is your last chance to get in on that. And we'll do the drawing. And the winner is going to be that dude. One, two, three, four, one. And congratulations. Uh, make sure you reach out to First Updates Now either on Twitch or in our Discord uh, for uh, with your ma mailing information so we can get that shipped out to you. Just a reminder, Go Build it does all the shipping for this stuff. Uh, so it will typically take about two to four weeks for you to receive what you have. And if you're not in our Discord already, make sure you join. Uh, we have uh, over 1,350 people now in our Discord talking about FTC and FRC. Uh, it is a pretty... Uh, quieter and civil discord uh, i will say um so we it's really just like do you want to talk about stuff on the show stuff to be on the show and just some general ftc things uh we tend to keep most of the uh, uh other stuff out of our discord so uh congratulations once again for the win and thanks again to go build up for the awesome giveaways yeah uh and we're gonna have i think we're gonna have another show in two weeks uh, that's going to be FTC recap. And then on April 10th, actually, uh, I'll talk about this for a quick second right now. Then we're going to throw out a lot more stuff on social media. On April 10th, we're going to be doing an FTC reveal show. So if you guys are going to Worlds and you create a robot reveal, send it to us. But please don't release it beforehand. Uh, and then we're going to release all of those here live on air. Uh, I'll probably be on. I think Ethan will be on. Um, then we're going to get some other guest hosts who you've actually never seen on the air before, uh, who are really involved in first to provide some awesome, um, analysis of those reveal videos. Um, so that should be a really fun, awesome night checking out all the 
uh, what, uh, not, why am I forgetting how to do math? 320 teams going to Worlds. Um, so hopefully do we they get have a lot to of go submissions. to Worlds, Nathan? If they're not, if do they, they don't have... go to Worlds, can they still submit? I'm fine with that as long as you haven't submitted your reveal beforehand. Okay. Uh, so that's the caveat. You can't submit your reveal beforehand because if everyone did, what's the point in watching our show, hearing our commentary about the reveals? Um, no so, promises, by the way, but if we do get enough teams that are interested in submit, I will submit to get us on the Twitch front page. It is no promises for something like that, but if there's enough interest from the FTC community, uh, we are a Twitch partner, so we do get some pull with that, and we have an awesome uh, rep uh, for that. We got on the front page for FRC, and we had 90,000 views live on air. Uh, so if there are enough teams that submit that really want to uh, do this, uh, we will try to make it happen. So that will be Wednesday, April 10th. Uh, expect some more uh, resources and information about that coming out uh, this weekend or early next weekend. So thanks to everyone watching and uh, uh, thank you for all the followers and subscription we received today. Uh, don't forget that you can subscribe. Have I already done this? No, thank you. Uh, don't forget that you can subscribe for free if you or your parents have Amazon Prime. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode of FTC Recap. If you want to stay connected with what FTC Live is doing, follow us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at FunFTC and join our Discord through the link in the chat. Uh, so on behalf of myself, Ethan, Shishir, Ishan, Josh, and our producer, Tyler, working behind the scenes, we thank you for tuning in. Thanks, guys. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now.